Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another week of the Lucas and Zach podcast. And last week, we talked about Tom Hanks' 1980s run, in particular focusing on the wonderful film Big. This week, we're going to talk about Tom Hanks and the 1990s, and we're going to talk about Apollo 13. Zach, my co-host, is here. Zach, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm glad to do another movie based on my personal history and the time I went to um, space um, and, and gladly made it back safe, but I still never touched that goddamn moon. I know, and you got zero moon rocks, zero moon rocks in your house, so it's really messing with the uh, the balance. <laughs> One side of his house is like 200 pounds lighter than the other. It's, it's really bad. Um, but of course, we start every week talking about the last movie we logged on Letterboxd. So, Zach. Why don't you hit us with your last movie you've logged? I logs. I'm thinking of ending things. Um, I try to stay positive, so I don't really like saying that out loud. We should change the title. But anyways, the movie is um, I'm thinking of ending things. Uh, it's the movie where people can get really defensive about how dumb they are. Um, there's a movie where people might lie and say they understand it when it's okay to like it without understanding it. It's also the movie where some people can be open to the puzzle of it all, which I am. I think there's um, people say like, what's the answer? There's no one answer. So that's mm -hmm. not a um, easy question to ask. I think it, the, what's the magic of the movie is that every time you watch it, there is 500 different answers that you can come up with and every single one is right that's what haters of these puzzle like movies um you know should be open to that it's okay to be wrong or have a different opinion than someone else because based on your perspective and your history um you're going to come up you're going to focus on different aspects of the movie or different themes or topics they're going to and, and it, it's just so rich in the detail in every part of the movie on the direction or the acting um the screenplay with moments switching you know what they're going for every five seconds it, i think it all packs in so much stuff to dig into that you can come up with a number of things so i, I think it's an interesting movie and can you know be endlessly searched so i promote it um say watch it and if you just um you can pretend you're smart it's okay it's better than hating it and tell other people <laughs> they're pretenders. you it's better to pretend you get it than yell at everybody and tell them call them liars and so you don't have to feel like you're dumb. Uh, I will agree with that. Um, I have not seen this film yet, so I guess I am among those people that you are speaking to telling him to watch it. So I'll have to get on that. Um, I'll go ahead and take, talk about the movie, last movie I logged. So the last movie I logged was 2001's Tim Burton's remake of Planet of the Apes, which is a really bizarre and weird film, which feels very Tim Burton. The kind of sad thing is I think arguably from a design aspect, it has the coolest design of any Planet of the Apes movie. I kind of like all the armor. I think that looks kind of cool. but. Um, Oh, yeah. Um, please don't let Mark Wahlberg play lead characters in movies like this. It just doesn't work. It's, uh, yeah, it's rough. Should we let the apes play real characters in other Mark Wahlberg movies? I think we should remake all Mark Wahlberg movies with <laughs> chimpanzees. Chimpanzees <laughs> in the natural, chimpanzees in Invincible. Just let you it, won't. I mean, no, a chimp could return punts. In the happening, as a science teacher, just as believable. I mean, absolutely. All right, so let's go ahead to our discussion of our main film for this week, which is, of course, Apollo 13, 1995, Tom Hanks film. And my co-host, Zach, is really bad at describing plots of movies, even for movies he has watched relatively recently. So Zach is going to enthrall us with his wonderful rendition of what the plot of Apollo 13 is. Here, you see, I didn't even give a shot at trying to say the plot of I think if anything. It's mainly because there is no plot, but that would have been just a disaster. <laughs> um, so it, um, it's about space um, or, or people going to space. So it's after the Apollo 11 mission, Tom Hanks, um, character named Con Tom Hanks, um, was unable to um, be on that. He was the backup astronaut guy. And so he got the chance to go to the Apollo 13 mission after another group had to drop out. Um, so him and a bunch of um, buddies, um, they hop on a, on a space shuttle, they go to space, a bunch of shit happens. I never understand any of the shit happening. That's part of the magic of the movie. Like this thing won't connect to this thing and this random plug exploded. And um, you know, half the ship's on fire. Um, there's 
evil aliens um, attacking the ship. This um, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make any sense, um, but it's still somehow the ingenuity of scientists and people on calculators and people over the phone are able to make sure that Tom Hanks and his um, buddies um, make it back to space safely so they can hug their wives and tell their kids they love them. I, I think that's actually a pretty good um, uh, plot description. Yes. Uh, unless you're a real nerd for this stuff, I think a lot of that space stuff definitely goes over your head. Um, yeah. But I also like how how, uh, how technical the movie is and that they want it to be really accurate to, you know, how complicated flying a spaceship is. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that when we get to the topics. Absolutely. And this is the time to get to our main, like, points that we've thought about this movie we wanted to talk about. So uh, Zach really wanted to start us off talking about Tom Hanks and him as a hero. Um, Zach, yeah. why don't you tell our audience what you're thinking there? So, um I mean, I think we should start every conversation talk about Tom Hanks as our theme. So I, I really want that to be our, our our focus on is what does this movie show about him and his different you know personas he brings to camera. Um, and I think this really um, maybe there's some other examples of this earlier on, but I think this is is the start of we became one of Tom Hanks' defining um, characteristics as an actor, which is he loves playing. Um, not always real people, but often real people who are like these noble heroes, these people of stability and control that help others get out of chaotic situations. You see this role done in Captain Phillips. It's done in Sully. It definitely has um, pegged that role in all 2020, our 2010s films. That's became his complete go-to thing. I feel like a little bit in the post um, as What's-His-Face. Um, that's his name, the great journalist, What's-His-Face. Um, he um, has a little bit of that kind of controlled leadership. Um, Saving Private Ryan is, yeah, one of the basic examples. But this is, you know, the start of this, of Tom Hanks being, you know, the guy that America can count on. He has, you know, the charm to make us want to be engaged and follow him. But then just such a, you know, calming fatherly presence to help us do such stressful situations. So he's became the go-to person of, you know, chaotic event movies. Um that we root for and hope they get out of and believably, you know, solve it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Definitely would throw in um, to that theme, Saving Private Ryan, Captain John Miller's, well, definitely one of those characters where he's just, his goal is to, he has to hold the team together. He's not necessarily, he doesn't have, the, he doesn't have to do the, he doesn't have to make the big shot. He doesn't have to do the big action, but his job is to hold the team together. That's kind of the Tom Hanks thing. Even in this movie, I mean, a lot of the technical stuff when it comes down to it, he's turning to Bacon or he's turning to, and I'm blanking on the guy's name because I'm an idiot. Um, I, 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 I never blank on anybody's name ever. Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. Yeah. He's often turning to Bacon or Paxton to do a lot of the technical stuff when it's like, who's going to who's gonna you know reboot the ship after they shut it down? Well, that goes to Bacon. Who's going to go and fly into the new module and figure out how to work with that? Well, that's Paxton's job. And it's just like, but he is, at the end of the day, the guy who's, whose job it is to get between them when they start fighting, make sure that everybody's being smart. Yeah. And not that they're wild cards, but like comparably they're the wild cards on the ship. You know, Paxton gets really sick, you know, throughout the, um, the end of the flight on um, bacon, um, you know, has to leave post-its so he doesn't lose his mind and kill everybody because right. he is just kind of um, getting a little mentally unwell. And, and, and that's where Hanks, you know, is that middle man, that steady, stable mentality. Um, to keep everybody grounded. And it, he does it again and again, and I think he does it to America. He started the COVID crisis, and he kept helped us go into it with a steady, stable <laughs> mind because we all take it very seriously and definitely are not losing our minds during this quarantine. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think this is kind of Tom Hanks' thing is he's just kind of the calming presence that makes everybody feel like even the worst situation will get better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know you wanted to talk about a couple technical aspects in this film, in particular, editing and sound, and how you think they do a really good job of creating tension. Why don't you um, Why don't you talk about that? Yeah. So um, we got called out by uh, a friend of ours 
named Mr. Paul Yama saying that somehow we make it through big and we don't even like talk about Penny Marshall's name <laughs> or mention anybody else. That's, you know, part of the movies. I want to try to give a little more credit to, um, you know, some of the crew and other cast members and not just Tom Hanks, because it takes um, a whole group of people to make, you know, a great movie as Apollo 13. Um, so the technical aspects that really stick out to me um, with Apollo 13, I really think help it function is the editing. Um, whoever and same I don't know who the editor is but Ron Howard I'm sure has a big part to do with it at least his vision of the movie but the way Ron Howard and his editor as well as the score by James Horner on um, the way it functions together I think became a template for a lot of astronaut movies to come but as we you were saying there's really technical stuff happening I have no idea what's happening but I care so much because the way you're flashing back between the astronauts and their faces reacting and how serious the command center is taking it and watching their whole like kind of a procedural um effect of how they're trying to solve the situation that I don't know what they're solving but because the editing is so kinetic, I stay so engaged that I, I really care and I, I feel stressed for these people and the score is just kind of um, bearing along in a way that is, you know, not overly tense. There's still like some kind of, you know, mel melodic common quality, but still keeping you in suspense of what's going to happen. And I think it's... um you know, done again and again through or, or uh, gravity or, you know, Ad Astra, any astronaut movies, that kind of chopping or the Martian between command centers and the astronauts and having make sure you understand as much as possible by showing you what um, cutting between the emergency between astronauts reactions and that. And so it's, I think, important filmmaking for the time. Yeah, I think also the score does a really good job, especially when they're in the ship of being really kind of quiet and calm in the background when they're just doing the mundane tasks, but then also really like heightening the moments where it is really important that they get the math calculation right, or they put something in the right way. Just like the moments where stuff really matters, the score really helps emphasize that. Now I want to do give a shout out. This movie was edited by Daniel P. Hanley and Mike Hill. So give the credit to them for, um, yeah, I think it's a really, really well edited film. And I think, you have to do a good job of showing technical aspects of this is how complicated this is, but you also don't want to have any of your characters giving a lecture and you could very easily write dialogue and edit in a way where a character was giving some long-term lecture, but that's not really the way they do it. They do a really good job of making sure that they're always speaking the speak, always being technical about the aspects of flying. But at the same time, I don't think they ever make it boring, even if you don't understand all the stuff like we didn't. Like, I don't think either of us understood all the technical aspects of the flying they were talking about. And um, it's still a really enjoyable movie. I definitely expected you're gonna come in, but you didn't understand <laughs> how that, you know, fume plug broke and why it was so important to the um, stability and temperature maintenance of the ship. I'm saying things that somewhat make sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'm a scientist. I'm not that type of scientist. I don't have that technical background. So unfortunately, I'm not as much help to us here as I could be somewhere else. I'll watch a master class about astrophysics phys phys um, and I'll get back to you. This is sponsored by Masterclass. <laughs> All right. And I know we both wanted to talk about families, me more generally in terms of the families of the astronauts. And you wanted to talk specifically about um Tom Hanks's character. Remember, we always call him Tom Hanks's character's wife. Tom Hanks. That's Tom Hanks. His character is named Tom Hanks. That's correct. He is really Tom Hanks in all movies. And we're going to talk about the character named um, Concerned Wife, um, played by um, <laughs> Kathleen Quinlan. It's worse when I say it about a woman. I hear it now. Yeah, sounds, from, I'm just the wife. Way worse. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll call her Kathleen Quinlan. Um, Kathleen Quinlan is Tom Hanks' wife. Um, in real life and in the movie, that is not true. Um, Kathleen Quinlan, I don't know her from anything else. I know she was Oscar nominated for this um, film. Um, and I think she does a terrific job um, in a role that um, is not productive, I think, for any actress's career. It's something I feel like many actresses have to go through, which is be playing the concerned wife of a um, you know noble hero, Tom Hanks like nope. character um, of the ones being at home just concerned they're going to make it back and their whole life depends on 
you know, the acts of, you know, what their husband is going through and, it, and that's what it revolves around. They don't do anything with this character that they didn't do 20 times after or maybe before it if I'm forgetting some things. But she still does a great job um, with that kind of role. She still sells the, the emotion. I think there's, uh, especially right after the launch where there's moments of like, she's trying to be, you know, there for the, not paparazzi, but for the media and, and trying to appear perky. And she's talking to Bill Paxton's wife um, who's kind of having a breakdown about it. She's about to have another kid. I don't know the plot. Um, and um, she's like, oh, I'm actually like freaking out. Like I look okay. I think she sells that, you know, withheld um, like torment and worry that she has with Tom Hanks while still having that outer um, appeal of, oh, we're so proud and everything is okay. And I think that's a remarkable thing to do. And I don't think that's, that side of it is done in all the other concerned wife characters. Um, but for the not great role that this is, she does, you know, a terrific job with it. Yeah, she's certainly given more like value by the story than I think that role typically is, in that they do really want to focus on like she's one of the three main areas they keep cutting to throughout the film, especially after the bad stuff happens. Like watching her deal with it is like a very important part of the film, just as much as it is watching Ed Harris deal with like the whole team on the ground. And um, it really makes it like, it's really, you know, I think helps humanize all the characters. My larger point here would be like how humanizing all the families help the main astronauts be. So when they're up in space, they may be talking, you know, astrophysics gobbledygook to most of us, but because their families seem like such an important part of their lives, it really makes you connected to them. They're talking about stuff that I don't understand, but I think everyone understands quite easily the idea that these men have families on the ground who clearly care for them. They clearly like being around each other. They have these relationships and even like a very short set of time, they set up like legitimate relationships with both Hanks and Paxton. And just in a way that when the bad stuff is happening up in space, you're really, really invested in hoping they come back because they have families who really want them to come back. And you don't want to see, you know, their families hurt any more than they already are by just having to watch this bad stuff happen. Yeah, I feel like it's really important in theory, like when they come up with these roles and, and maybe early on, but it's became so overdone and heavy you know, true life story of someone going through a horrific act that's became a trope. And once it becomes a trope, it, you you just start getting a little impatient, waiting for how are they going to move past this and give me something different. And you just kind of feel sorry for the actresses doing something 30 times other. And, you know, not could be given a role where they can, you know, have a character a little more fleshed out. Yeah, absolutely. Um I think Give, Anne Hathaway in Dark Waters is like the most recent example of an actress just getting buried. Claire and, Foy, <laughs> Claire Foy, alongside Ryan Gosling, that she, one's a really. Packs, I feel like she she's a little bit more. Detail. She's a little feistier. They give her a little more of a unique personality, um, and especially using her as a comparison. That I think her plot is all still the trope, but the, the characterization she's able to put in the That's performance, right. I think, helps step it. Yeah, Hathaway's a pretty bad one because it's like. She's an Oscar winner, and you gave her a nothing role in this movie. You'll forget she's in the movie a month later. You really do, yeah. Except uh, me now saying that she was in this movie and <laughs> talking about it with August. More people should watch Dark Waters. That's a really good it's film. It's really good. Hey, it was um, my wife Sarah's favorite movie of 2019. She only saw like eight, but let's Dude, call I, it. I loved that movie, so I am <laughs> completely there with your wife. That movie is awesome. Um, so... Let us, uh, we, I just mentioned it for a second, but let us go there to Ed Harris and the command center on the ground. You wanted to talk about them and their impact on the film. Yeah, um, well, not, not really their impact as much as a, a query. I was hoping <laughs> that you did have more of an actual physicist background. <laughs> in it. But like, what's their job? Like, there's like 200 of them. And I feel like there's not that much to do. Like, you're all responsible for your own specific thing of the ship. Like, sure, that sounds important, but like you only have to be active for like 30 seconds at a time. You don't need a hundred people constantly shouting to whoever on the phone. They're all talking to somebody the whole time. You don't see anything else about them all losing their minds. I feel like it, when there's an issue, it's a specific issue. Like the first thing is, um, you know, what explodes? Can you tell me anything technical? What's the, fir the first thing? What figure? explodes? Yes. Um, 
I believe the biggest problem initially is they start venting oxygen. That was the initial problem. It's something when he tried to clean. They tried to. Uh, we we're bad at this, aren't we? <laughs> uh, I I promise you, I took notes, but I can only keep up so much. Um, so, anyways, once something explodes, like everybody's in action. I feel like there's a specific thing that went wrong, and you're focused on oxygen. They asked my favorite part of the jobs of command center <laughs> is Tom Hanks is like, I'm doing math. I need my math checked. And the whole row of people are like, I got this. I feel like they were busy. They were doing something. You all had the time for 20 of you to do the exact same math problem. I guess it's space and they need to double check, but like you should be good yeah. enough. You don't need double checks. You're already double checking for Tom Hanks. If both of you fuck up, you should have never been hired in this position. And I saw his paper. There was like 10 formulas. I'm convinced I could have done that math. <laughs> I was just looking and get it because I'm a genius, guys. I'm real smart. Yeah. Uh, so I just I looked it up. What they did is they tried to stir oxygen canisters and one of them exploded in the process and that's why it started venting oxygen thank you for that that sounds well, like a problem that 20 people can talk about now all 100 on phones with other people saying it my favorite group of um uh, of command center people was just like the macgyver room that their whole job is just like we we're gonna get, they just stayed in that room they were doing who knows what until the guy comes in okay i got something for us we need to <laughs> fit this into this with like a spacesuit and toilet paper and a banana oh and i don't i don't understand how that filter works at all because i look at that and i'm like i don't think that would do anything but it clearly did something because they didn't die would so. you watch a spin-off movie of them just in that room <laughs> trying to macgyver this thing the whole hour and a half of them figuring out how to get this like square yes. into a triangle yes i do think the one thing you're missing is the reason they have so many people in that command center is I believe they have three to four people at each station so that they can switch off if they need to, if somebody needs sleep. The they idea is that they have to, no, but they have to man it all the time. And I think that the idea is that they're having to man, there's so many different functions for the spaceship that have to be manned at all times. Like Ed Harris has to act, ask for status reports from like nine people at a time. What are you doing? Just watching the monitor? I feel like I believe so. need more guidance because extras are just like this all the time. Like they're constantly <laughs> doing things. Uh, and I think it's really like you're just doing this for like hours. <laughs> just, it's there and, yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that is definitely possible. Definitely possible. I definitely think the people in the problem solving room, the technical name for it, were just like hanging out, drinking beers until that guy came and was like, got a problem. The MacGyver and that, room. Sorry. And that's when they decided they all needed coffee because they had to catch up <laughs> after the beers they've been having. Yes, I do actually. I, I do love all the interactions on the ground. I think they're really interesting. Um, even though um, I'm not completely convinced that all those actors know what they're saying when they're saying it. I feel like they were just given pages with words on it and they're like, just say this. It'll sound like you know what you're talking about. Just you sell that really does Seem like they know what they're talking about. Clint Howard. Clint Howard fucking owns. Uh, he's real good in this movie. He has like 10 lines, but I feel like he's the most believable pie hairline issues. But I feel like he he sells it. I yeah. like he has the best line in the movie, which is when Kevin Bacon makes a dumbass like IRS joke, and Clinton House like, you know, this is this is not joke. They're, they're like, they're gonna... <laughs> I do like the fact they have to call Nixon to get a waiver on his taxes. <laughs> like that is gonna be the weirdest thing ever, and I'm just like, how on earth is that a thing? Um, one thing. I wanted to talk about, and we've already kind of touched on this, so I, I'll make it quick here, is I love how technical the aspects of space travel are. Like, I love the fact that um, they really focus on that. Like, even when stuff goes wrong, they're really focused on small details and just, like, you have to make sure this switch gets turned on and this switch doesn't get turned on. And it's all, like, the small stuff rather than just being, like, we're going to... Because you could have easily made a movie like this where you focused on every big explosion every big event but they show so much of like man they need to make sure they do the math on like the spin correctly and like oh it's coming in too high or it could bounce off like that stuff is really cool i love them intercutting um the news reports where like the news reports almost give you exposition about like oh if it if the sh if you know the if the blast shield is cracked because of the explosion and they come in too hot then like it could explode like they do like a really good job of giving you all these technical aspects uh, just enough so you understand the stakes at all times, but not too much so you go, oh, I, I don't have any idea what's going on anymore. I'm going to check out now. 
Yeah, they definitely trust the audience. They don't treat us like we're stupid. They trust the audience and they trust their own filmmaking process that there would be enough engaging that will make it just make enough sense. But no matter what's happening, we can still be engaged. I think definitely like the right stuff might have, have like set the you know formula for how to do this to film the right stuff. Yeah. On because they get really time to go into how these different you know planes and then space shuttles were developed. Um, you know. Um, all through a process of improving upon each other and they also do not withheld the technical info and i feel like apollo 13 you know maybe you learned like we don't need to dumb it down let's you know for those who really care let's make it intellectually satisfying for them um but for those who are not care let's make it you know smart enough to have some concept for them of what's going on but also just you know engaging enough for them to, you know, not fully care if they get it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, really good job on that aspect. Uh, I do want to talk about a really small moment, which I think is really interesting in that uh, it says a lot about the main character is when they lose contact with the base on the ground, when they're going around the dark side of the moon, um, <laughs> Lovell has the dream. Or like the hallucination. I guess I, I guess hallucination is probably a better term for it, considering they are suffering from various physical defects at that point. Um, dream. dream, 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 hallucination, where he sees himself walking on the moon, and I think it's this really interesting moment of having the main character, who's been so focused on we have to fix everything. This is how we do it. Keep going, keep going. Has this really small moment of reflection and just like my goal was to be able to be on the moon and i've never been there i've been into space but i've never been on the moon i told everyone i was going to the moon i told people i was going to bring a moon rocks back and he's like it's just this moment where i think and even before the mission he tells everybody this is my last flight so he's kind of up there really kind of coming to grasp with the idea that i'm never going to be on the moon i've spent so much of my life training and working i spent all these different weeks all this time away from my family all this time preparing to go to the moon because that was his goal and that's the moment he has to just kind of like let it go and just be like i have to get back to earth and it's this really interesting i think pull for him between his goal which was to get on the moon and he the people he cares about who are back on earth and he kind of has to accept that this didn't work he has to go back to earth and he's never going to go back up because he won't put his family through it again. I just think it's a really kind of really beautiful small moment of reflection in the midst of like so much turmoil and chaos. I'm glad you love it. I'm really happy for you. It's the okay. cheesiest part of the movie. It, I, don't think, I don't think I would put it. I don't think it's the cheesiest part of the movie. I think they're cheesier parts at the end. Well, I that that didn't really work for me. I think they could have relied on just you know tom hanks's face and, and you know physical experience to still um express that idea without having to hit the nail on the head and show us him imagining you know what he went through but you can see you know the you know kind of grieving for his you know lost dream um you can see that through his eyes if he's just staring at the moon i think there's other you know less silly ways that they could have um you know, showed the same theme of someone moving past their dream. Um, so I'm, I'm glad it moved you. I was like, okay, this is like <laughs> um, alternate history stuff. Or I care about people losing their dreams. Zach says, get over it. Stop being a weirdo. Well, um, I, this is, I, I'm, I'm interrupting with a sixth topic that I almost <laughs> put in. But uh, connecting to his dream, I think part of it why is because I like cannot empathize with that kind of dream at all i get very frustrated with you know the male ego of needing to dominate space that like nothing else matters not the like possibility that you might die or your kids that he has to like lie to is worried about your dad that doesn't matter i just need to conquer the moon i need to step in that dirt because i gotta be better than neil armstrong and that's all that matters even this is neil armstrong that it's just that male pride and competitive ego and uh Need to conquer the environment around us so we can feel bigger than the moon. And I, I, I feel like I need a space movie to, to really kind of conquer that idea. Um, and, and I think maybe the way you were able to see that scene, I think that does address that a little bit. That he's able to understand there's more important things in life, like at that point, survival. Which is not how I was able to read the movie. 
That's fair. That's fair. I think it's. I think it's, it's a scene that is very much open to interpretation and very much to the eyes of the beholder. Um. So another thing that kind of plays into mentality is I was sort of tied into what you said before, but the idea of the power of positivity and the no lose mentality. So something that happens really early on in this film, as soon as bad stuff starts happening, is the people on the ground have this just positivity, no lose mentality. Ed Harris, we're getting them back. There's they keep asking him, what are the odds? What are the odds? He's like, we're not losing them. It's just like he doesn't have any other idea in mind. He's not even letting the possibility that they could lose them, that this could be a catastrophe. Other people around them are like, this could be the biggest catastrophe in NASA history. Ed Harris, nope, we're getting them. We will get them back. You know, his wife is like, my my husband's coming, coming, home, coming home on Friday. Tom Hanks' mom. Oh, he could, they could, they could make a, you know, a refrigerator fly. He'd fly it. There's just this positivity and this um, no lose mentality that they just have throughout the film. And I think this is really like a sign of like the toughness of the human spirit is just like, everything's going bad. Everything's crazy. But like, you know what? What we'd much rather believe that we're, that, that good things will happen than bad things will happen. So we're just going to like stick there and we're getting them back. It's the only yeah. option. I think you're definitely touching on the biggest theme of the movie is that like um, American ingenuity, you know, can, can solve all that. There's nothing unaccomplishable if we can, you know, keep our head up and keep pushing forward. And, and you know, every puzzle, every problem can be solved, you know, as long as you said there's no quitting. Um, uh, so I, I, I think especially, you know, we're going to go back to the MacGyver room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the MacGyver room, like that seems they it proposes it as a impossible thing to do to fit the you know triangle and squares of the triangle. But um you don't get to see it, unfortunately, but you can see it in Apollo 13 too, um, the problem solving room. Um but but their you know their ingenuity and their you know no quit, like this this seems impossible. We're definitely gonna do it. They never, you know, give a moment second to think that's not possible. They all immediately jump on. You know, with hope and and optimism, and that is definitely, you know, every character in the movie that's way they're able to get the job done and bring them home safe is because they never see another option. Yeah, and like a really big part of this that I didn't mention my first time is Gary Sinise, the guy who gets pulled off the mission and then comes back and he's like, "All right, I'm going to get in to the simulator and I'm going to figure out a way to do a sequence so they can start it up again, but not go over this thing." And he just keeps doing it over and over and over again and they never have a moment where he's like this is pointless we'll never do it he's just like i'm gonna do it until i find the way because i need to get them home and it's just like that mentality kind of just yeah. seeps throughout the film especially that character who might be my favorite character in the movie um because he he also has overcome his own jealousy and yeah. um disappointment with him being pulled out because he possibly was in measles also a topic i was want to talk um kind of a uh not a great movie for covid where we don't want to believe in our health officials and it's like very anti um space surgeons like how dare they tell me i'm sick when i'm not sick but anyways he was unable to go uh space because the surgeon viewed him as getting measles but he was able to you know overcome any animosity that he was holding um, about that uh, event and about that conflict and be able to, you know, put his head back up high and do what's important for, you know, his his friends and his former team. Because um, that above all that, you know, solving the issue came first uh, before anything he was able to, his own personal experience that he could hold against them easily. Absolutely. I, and this ties back to what I think is, in my opinion, the main theme of the film, which I think is especially prescient in this day and age, which is that I think the theme of the film is teamwork, expertise, and intellectualism. And the idea that the reason that these guys succeed is because A, you have a lot of really smart people who have a lot of expertise and a lot of knowledge there working together. And I think this is a really patriotic movie, but not in the jingoistic rah-rah kind of like stupid patriotism. It's more like really smart pages of saying, look what America can do when we get all the really smart people and all the really like brave people together and they work really hard to fix a problem. And they're like, we're just not going to quit. I'll do the calculations. You do this. You go in the room and figure out how they can vent out carbon dioxide. You figure out how they can run the system so they can turn it back on, but not go over the power thing. And it's just this movie that I think is incredibly patriotic, but also like brings back in how valuable it is to have 
teamwork and just expertise with a bunch of really smart people working together to accomplish a shared goal. Yeah, it's the magic of what people can do to unite for a common cause. You know, it, it, once again, to relate to current times, it, it, it's that we need to be reminded of this. We all need to watch Apollo 13 and one big and driving together. Remember, if we were to unite the magic things that we can solve together, um, and, and I mean, maybe it's not a realistic thing at all, but to keep that as an idealistic approach, like these guys always have the idealism that, you know, space, you know, can, can be conquered by us, but also the idealism that these people are not going to die. Like, it's probably what was going to happen but they can keep their, you know, best case scenario always up. So if we were together with the best case scenario always in mind, you know, maybe we don't accomplish the best case scenario, but we can still accomplish, you know, magnificent things. Yeah, no, it was really interesting to watch, especially, and let's just be right up with it. We're dealing with COVID-19 and our country has kind of done a pretty awful job of dealing with it. We've way what too many infections. <laughs> way I'm too many infections. So it doesn't even exist. Way too I many infections. <laughs> <laughs> joking. Just to be clear, we both believe it's a real thing. Way too many infections, <laughs> way too many deaths. And like, you do wonder if the spirit that lives throughout this movie was applied to a problem like a pandemic and just like, mm -hmm. hey, do shit, do shit to help each other. Like, do the help, be smart, listen to smart people, and like, let the smart people make the smart moves so that we can all like bring home people as safely as possible. So I think and it's like the empathy involved in that. Like the, the, everyone who put in the hard work, this was not their lives and they may be not, we're all connected to these astronauts, but the empathy that, you know, their lives matter and what the struggle that someone else is going through is important for you to do the best you can to help them. is something that a lot of people forget that just because it's not directly affecting you, the empathy that you could be helping those around you, you know, overcome a struggle is important to remember. That's right. Be the Gary Sinise, brush off your bruised ego, come back and work your butt off to help people come home safe, you know? Yeah. Lucas, I'm really a... proud that as the two white guys on this podcast, we, we just helped solve all of America's problems. And we're all uh, Well, <laughs> no more peace prizes all around. Um, yeah. Zach, you wanted to talk about your reaction to the end of the film, which I am waiting breathlessly to find out what your reaction was. Yeah, so uh, I, I have seen this movie. Um, I saw it probably as a 13 or 12 year old. Um, and I like to think that I am someone who uh, is pretty knowledgeable of historical events in recent history. I definitely thought these guys died. Like the whole time, I thought this whole movie was lead up to all of them died. If you asked me what Apollo 13 was about four days ago, before I watched the movie, I'd be like, yeah, it's about a space shuttle that exploded and everyone died. That's, I held out, not hope, I'm going to say I held out hope that these people, I held out the idea that they're going to die until the last one minute of the movie. And like, even when they're being helped out of the water, I'm like, this is a dream sequence. This is them imagining. They're saying they all oh die. God. This is a historical event. I know what happens. Um, they don't die. Uh, I don't know what I'm thinking of. Uh, Armageddon, maybe. <laughs> they explode. Uh, but I can tell you, I was very shocked that Tom Hanks was walking at the end of this movie. Who knew? And I, I thought know. all this ingenuity and problem solving was going to be for nigh, for nothing, because they exploded anyways. And it was going to be about at least the you know effort was there. I was all in here ready to talk about the effort, and even when it, it ends in failure and the spaceship explodes, I thought there's no way they came out with their heat shell grip. When they were counting five seconds, I was like, ah, this is it. They're past five seconds. They're gone. I knew this happened. But I was a little disappointed when we didn't get to see the, the ship explode. And they came back They they're on the mic. I was like, what the fuck is this? This is a different movie. They remade history. Um, so it turns out I know nothing. Um, Sarah was very um, amused. Because that's immediately what I screamed at her. I'm like, they don't die. <laughs> they ended. Uh, so they're still alive. Um, good for Jim Lavelle. I hope he lives a long, happy life. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this would be a Tom Hanks, Ron Howard movie if they all died at the end. It doesn't really I seem think, like. I think we would be watching. I think we would been watching a documentary like in like 2010 on this movie instead of a 1995 feature film. I convinced Sarah to watch it. Because I said it was like one of the biggest tear jerkers. Because I assumed everyone cried when they died. <laughs> Celine Dion comes on and Steven Tyler together to sing a song for us to all be in our emotions as you see them burning in flames. I would watch 
the ending to this movie where Steven Tyler and Celine Dion sing a song for like yeah. 10 minutes, just the last 10 <laughs> minutes of the movie Celine Dion and Steven Tyler just riffing. I would watch yeah. that movie. It might be terrible, but I'd watch it anyway. Yeah, I'm too. floored. I have, I have, I have no words, Zach. Um, thank I, you for I sharing. I really thought this was like the Titanic. I thought it was like Titanic where you watch something happen, you know, an hour through the movie, the big event, and you just watch them slowly, like degrade to their death, like in Titanic. Ooh. It was. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm sure many people had this reaction um in 1995. Um, for those who didn't keep up with the story, I mean, it was a real story. Who am I? I should know these things. You know, it's kind of famous too. I just I'm getting old. We talk about how bad my memory is. Uh, it's yeah. rough, guys. I'm I will probably next time I'll watch this and once again forget that they're still alive. <laughs> Two years from now, when I watch it I again kind of want to see if that happens because I think it would be amazing if you just rewatched it and still made the same mistake. <laughs> I mean, be, it makes for a very different experience. So my whole like lens going into it was different than yours because I was all under the assumption I knew where it was going. I know. That is certainly interesting. Thank you for sharing with us that with us, Zach. Um, do you have any final thoughts on Apollo 13? I think I've said my piece. Do you have anything else you'd like to say about the film before we move on? No, space is rad. It is pretty cool. Oh I'm really I think, excited I never got to go to space camp. Nickelodeon like, game shows like always advertise space camp. That was the prize. And I, I wanted to go in the game shows because like Guts is cool, but mainly I need to win to go to space camp. <laughs> I think what we're both saying is, hey, NASA, uh, Zach and I will do any training you require uh, if you send us to space. Yeah, I don't think I get nauseous that easy. Let's do this. Let's do it. All right, let's move on to our discussion of the 1990s and Tom Hanks. So last time we talked about the 80s, which is a – I think you quantify the 80s Tom Hanks run as every movie is a an SNL skit that they stretched out. Yeah. Kind of feels like it. I'm going to run down quickly which movies Tom Hanks did in the 1990s, and we can talk about them. So Tom Hanks starts the 1990s with Joe versus the Volcano, uh, which is his first rom-com collaboration with Meg Ryan. Then he does Bonfire of the Vanities, which is a Brian De Palma film. He does Radio Flyer, where he cameos. It's an uncredited cameo as the older version of Elijah Wood. A League of Their Own, he plays a kind of grumpy baseball manager for a women's team. Uh, Sleepless in Seattle, which is where Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan fall in love. It's a remake of Gary Grant film. Then he does Philadelphia, which is kind of his first big, like, oscar -y play. Plays a guy with AIDS who is defended by Denzel Washington. It's a really good film. Forrest Gump is a movie with where a man with developmental disability somehow ends up being a part of many moments in American history. we got Apollo 13, the one we just covered. Uh, Toy Story, which is uh, kind, of, kind of groundbreaking in terms of animation. And he also makes it acceptable to say the word Woody around children. Um, then he comes back the next year, does that thing you do, directs and stars in this movie. What were you saying, Zach? That's the worst joke I ever said, and I may quit the show. <laughs> Let's continue. All right. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, Captain John Miller, who has to um, shockingly, breaking news, rescue slash save Private James Francis Ryan. Look, at this, that's another terrible joke. Um, and then we got You've Got Mail, which I think is amazing, an all-time great rom-com. And then we bring back with Toy Story 2, uh, which is even better than the first one. And then we've got The Green Mile, where he stars alongside Marco, Michael Clark Duncan. So he does 14 films in the 1990s, which is one more than the 1980s, which is actually in some ways, if you consider sort of a slowdown of him, of his uh, film career, because in the 1980s, he barely does anything for like three of those years. Yeah, but he really... was, you know, working for it then. He was trying to prove himself and, you know, was not making billions of dollars per contract. Like he was able to once he got to, you know, the mid 90s. Yeah. yeah. I think I think if you look at his 90s work, up until about, I think A League of Their Own is kind of the end of the stuff he sort of does in the 80s as well. And Philadelphia is really the the new Hanks. Yeah, that's a good transition, especially working with Penny Marshall again, who he worked with. Movie right. Big. It was still kind of a comedic, um, you know, mainstream role. Um, and yeah. a supporting role, which is kind of weird for his career and stands out specifically. But um yeah, then Philadelphia is when he becomes treated as a more dramatic actor and someone that, you know, top tier established directors, you know, are really seeking for. I mean, Brian De Palma gave him a 90 and for Bonfire 
which was a failure, but that was really when, you know, you could see the t top tier directors, you know, I and this guy saying he's someone special and someone we need to moves. I think Big really established him, you know, for that. Uh, or, or Punchline, remember, it's, it's all because of Punchline. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but he creates a lot of important partnerships um, with Robert Zemeckis, you know, in the 90s and, and Steven Spielberg, he starts, um, he does end up doing three movies with starting with Saving Private Ryan in the 90s. Yep. Um, you know, Ron Howard, he did Splash with originally, but, you know, I think they've made five movies because of the Da Vinci Code Never Dies. Um, yep. So I think together, and he continues that, you know, with Apollo 13 that we're talking about today. Um, so he's, you know, becoming a go-to guy for many of the top tier mainstream blockbuster directors, you know, at the time. Right, and he starts working with Zemeckis in Forrest Gump and um, starts working with Darabont. And then, like, Toy Nora Story is kind Afron. of... Yeah, but, Nora but Afron, absolutely. He really helped establish Nora Afron at that point because um, she, she's had a movie before that, but not near as successful as Seabless in Seattle, where she, he was the, together. Right. They really helped form each other. And Meg Ryan is great in those movies, but Tom Hanks is definitely the draw for those movies. He is the big star that really i think gives nora the ability to kind of do whatever she wants because you've got tom hanks in your films for sure and then toy story is kind of an interesting aside in that he started doing the toy stories like he started actually doing the voice of that before he won the multiple oscars and then so it's like kind of weird that you almost have multi-time oscar winner tom hanks coming How back lucky is pixar like they I put know, their money right? on the right guy. They they're like they're really kind of the whole start of their um company, you know, on Tom Hanks. And it worked out wonderful. They get they get to launch and they have, you know, the number one star in America to, you know, help promote their movie. Yeah, it's like it's I think it's kind of I guess you kind of see this with a lot of franchises where it's really important to make sure that one guy at the beginning is cast really well. You know, Tom Hanks with Pixar really lets them go and get started, you know, and I think a good comparison is probably Robert Downey Jr. and Iron Man is that if the MCU doesn't get a guy like him who is so good in the role and like just blows up as big as he does, then like, you know, it's interesting to think about like how these um, franchises would have gone if they don't just have that that rock person to build around from the beginning. Yeah, because you don't have the money to go out and get the major start at that point. You have to bet on someone who will be up to that level. Right. And they're betting. The Toy Story probably, I'm assuming, paid more for Tim Allen. Probably. I, I mean, they were probably. The biggest TV star at the time at that point. They were probably betting on Tom Hanks coming off his 80 runs and maybe like Joe versus the Volcano and Bonafire versus the Vanities, but not like his big stuff that he'd just done before it. That stuff was, you know, after the fact. Yeah. I mean, what other things do you think? ties together this de decade i think it's less in some ways less interesting to talk about because the movies are less weird yeah and i mean i i, I established i think the major theme is he's really going for those you know stable male leader roles um i think the 90s helps exhibit um but also just becoming you know our moral conscious he helps you know america seek into our our viewers at least not america okay. helps viewers <laughs> <laughs> the guys, I am upset how many times I've said the word America. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna wear a, a flag shirt next week. Please don't. Uh, I, I definitely am. <laughs> Zach Ford will be off camera next week. <laughs> uh, um, oh goodness, Whew. canceled. Okay, um, he helps people, viewers explore our own conscious. You know, started with Philadelphia and helping us, you know, navigate through or empathize with people going through the AIDS crisis, which at that time, you know, watching that movie today, it can seem somewhat, you know, simplified version of it. But at that time it was pretty revolutionary um, for how he was able to, you know, empathize a AIDS character, how he can uh, help, you know, and then empathize with Forrest Gump as someone who's had struggles his whole life. I mean, that's a complicated character for a controversial character. For yeah. a number of reasons, but you know, he was able to make it work. Um, but really helping us experience new, you know, types of characters and, and bring um, you know, the empathy I said to 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 those views. Yeah. I think it was important. Yeah. Green Mile, another really good example of him just kind of providing empathy for a character that um without him giving that empathy in some ways 
that character just looks like a criminal and you kind of just he's like, our avatar is what it is he helps put us into those we can see the world through his eyes because we understand the kind of person Tom Hanks is so we can go through these you know different experiences through the Green Mile and experience you know the prison system of the 40s and, and you know the racism that some of these characters were going through because we can see it through Tom Hanks as our you know avatar absolutely yeah I think this is definitely his I think of all of his decades of his career, probably his biggest Oscar play decade where he was kind of clearly picking roles because like, I mean, I guess it's a I mix. think he still has had many Oscar roles. The Oscars have just given up on him. He's like the opposite yes. of Meryl Streep, which they decide, let's give Meryl Streep everything. But Tom Hanks has to, you know, throw five hula hoops and eat a whole pie at the same time as he acts to try and get a nomination at this point. I know. Um, R.I.P. Captain Phillips. I'm I'm very bitter about the Captain Phillips one because I think he's amazing in that <laughs> film and deserves more respect. Um, any final thoughts on the decade of the '90s and Tom Hanks' works? No, I said you think it's boring, but it, it it sets the precedent for everything to come and everything we've came and known about Tom Hanks. You know, yeah, we absolutely. wouldn't have who he is if it wasn't for you know this '90s one, one of the best runs that any actor was able to have, most legendary runs. So, absolutely, yeah. And and, um, do it these movies aren't made. No, I mean, yeah, this is a big budget film. dramas. Yeah, big budget dramas where the goal is, and also I think it, I think you know, like does pretty well at the box office. Like yeah. this movie made three hundred and fifty-five million dollars on okay. a fifty million dollar budget on a movie about a space mission. I think we forget how successful Bob Harris' directorial career has been. I know, yeah. Especially if you look at his recent stuff where it's like, this is just not, you know, yeah. like the highest quality. Well, yeah, because people don't care about those. I think some of the movies are just as good as he's made. Like, same quality, just people don't go see those movies anymore. He's kind of a lost artifact of a director. His classical, Absolutely. you know, filmmaking style. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So, and this concludes uh, another episode of our podcast. Next week, we're going to come back and talk about the 2000s run of Tom Hanks. Which is, I think Zach would agree, when it, it gets a little iffy for Tom Hanks. Yeah, this is it's very not, to take advantage of talking about movies that aren't great, although I haven't seen it. We're about to talk, and the film we're going to talk about is Steven Spielberg's The Terminal. Because um, I don't think you really can talk about Tom Hanks' career without talking about Spielberg at least once. I think it's a, And I think we've done a good job so far of picking really, um, you know, really quality directors that Hanks has worked with for our first two ones to um, as our films to talk about. So next week, the terminal. I want to thank Zach, who's being awesome. That's right, Zach is here. Um, and uh, I think we'll see you guys next week. Uh, if you look in the description of this, you'll see links to our Twitters, links to our letterbox, links to the show's Twitter, and the email for the show. Our t-shirt. That's right. We will link to our t-shirt so our public. <laughs> we have merch now. That's right. Look at us blowing up. Absolutely. Go grab some of that. Um, if yeah. you buy something, let me know so I can tell Absolutely. you I'm famous. If you buy something, <laughs> take a picture of yourself wearing it and tweet it at our show's Twitter account. We would love to retweet it. That would be awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you to our producers who do an awesome job and you know give us a place to put this every week. And with that, uh, we will see and you next week. Please remember... Go to Masterclass, type in Luke and Zach Podcast and get 20% off. Um, you can watch Natalie Portman teach about acting, and that's lovely. That's right. Absolutely. Um, Masterclass may be sending me some uh, cease and desist letters. <laughs> we will see what happens. Uh, that's it for us, folks. I'm Lucas. That's Zach. And this podcast is now over. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>